Client diversity is a challenge that Ethereum community is willing to overcome. To help users know more about Ethereum's EL and CL clients available to run a node, ECH brings the Know Your Client series. Welcome to the March special P Penny episode 77. I am Pooja Ranjan and with me is talented Ethereum developer Andrew Ashman to talk about the Ethereum client and Igor Mandrigin from the team. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having us. Hi. As per the official documentation, Ethereum is an implementation of Ethereum on the efficiency frontier written in Go. Andrew has been on our show earlier to talk about EIP 3607, the client implementation, yellow paper changes with respect to the proposal in episode 49. Check out the link in the description below. We are looking forward to learning more about the client and its progression towards the proof of stake world in this episode. May we kick off with a brief introduction for our new listeners, Igor and Andrew. Uh, yeah, so my name is Andrew, and uh, I've been part of the Aragon team uh, since uh, 2019, um, and uh, I've been working on Aragon, and uh, we also have a sister project, uh, Silkworm, um, written in C++, and I've been working on that as well. Uh, yeah, and my name is Igor. I also started working on Aragon in second half of 2019. I looked up my first commit actually <laughs> to, to find this information. But And uh, right now I'm also helping Aragon a little bit and also having my own little startup that's running nodes and whatnot. So I think some questions could be quite relevant to me. Welcome you both to the show. All right, uh, so maybe uh, we can uh, start with a brief introduction about client Aragon. Uh Yes, uh, so Aragon was uh, started as uh, TurboGeth, uh, I think back in 2018 by Alexey Akhunov. And uh, uh, his main focus um, was on uh, more efficiency, especially with regard to the database layout. So he believed, and well, that is still our belief that a lot of gains in the Ethereum space can be uh, obtained from optimizing uh, the database layout uh, rather than the EVM execution, which is also very important, of course, but um, uh, uh, what its database layout is key. And uh, we are still, um, we still haven't finished this process. We have greatly uh, refactored, optimized uh, uh, our database layout, but uh, we are still working on, on further improvements. Um, yeah, and I would add a little bit that there are three probably distinctive things that uh, Aragon does differently from other clients that I can mention. So the first is, of course, the database layout that Andrew already mentioned. The second is the staged sync architecture when the sync, it doesn't sync the same way as others. So instead of it splits it into like formal stages and processes data in bulk. And the third one is the modular architecture. That's uh, way more akin to how ETH2 or Beacon Chain clients are written when you have like separate, let's say, validator clients, separate wallets, separate Beacon node. So in our case, we have the whole architecture that's called Thorax. I think it's still called like this. When we have a separate downloader, separate sentry, separate uh, RPC daemon and, and, and whatnot. So those are the kind of uh, differences. And Silkworm and Akula, are actually re-implementation of the same architecture in different languages, basically. And we have a cute mascot, Aragon the Otter. <laughs> That's really cute. Uh, well, uh, you briefly mentioned about uh, Akula. I'm curious, like I heard that that is a Rust implementation. Yes, um, so uh, Akula is a, a Rust implementation. Uh, its main developer is Artem Vorotnikov, who used to uh, be a team lead at Open Ethereum. Um, so we have kind of uh, three projects. Uh, Aragon is our 
flagship project uh, written in, in Go, and uh, which is the most uh, complete and mature project of the three. And we also have Silkworm um, in C++ and Akula in, in Rust. Silkworm and Akula uh, are still no, not, not as mature as Aragon. Both in, in Akula and Silkworm, uh, they were started as greenfield projects uh, from scratch. Uh, they have the Apache license. They might, might make them a better uh, uh, suit for commercial applications. And uh, they should be also um, easier to understand because uh, uh, because the, the code base is is new and doesn't contain a lot of legacy features. And both uh, uh, both uh, Silkworm and uh, Akula should be uh, ultimately should be faster than Aragon because. Um, um, Unlike Go, there is no garbage collector, so the, 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 there is no that overhead in, in C++ and Rust. Yeah, I would also say that <clears throat> Aragon, as Andrew mentioned, it still contains a lot of traces of us figuring things out. And usually Akula and Silkworm, they follow when we already figured out how to do things the most efficient way. So usually it takes a couple of iterations on top of Aragon, and then it comes to, to those. So, yeah. One curious question here. Um, if I understand correct, uh, Aragon is currently not supporting the mining version of uh, Ethereum. Uh, what is there for Akula and uh, Silkworm? Um, well, so we in, in Aragon, uh, the, there was an experimental support of uh, uh, ETH mining but uh, without any GPU mining support. Um, and, um, but uh, with, uh, uh, with the merge, with the transition to uh, proof of stake, uh, Aragon will fully support uh, block building. Uh, and right now it also supports uh, um, my, uh, click, click mining. Um, so and it also supports ETH mining, but it's, it's not practical because because there is no GPU acceleration. But um, after the merge, um, uh, yeah, Aragon will be a fully fledged uh, in terms of block building as well. Um, and uh, as to uh, Silkworm and Akula, I don't think uh, I know there is no mining support in in Silkworm yet, and Probably not in Akula uh, either, mm, but that, that's something that we should add at some point. Yeah, I think it's also historically uh, <clears throat> transaction pool, which is important uh, component of any mining thing was the last thing we kind of get around to just remembering that Aragon started as a very, very small team. So we focused and the majority of clients uh, that run nodes, they don't really mine things so we focused on sort of the 80 80 percent of the things that people are actually need <laughs> like and then we kind of we had to put aside mining for a bit of a longer time and again with the merge coming right now it's more of a question of getting transactions from the pool and putting them into right order in the block and don't have to like solve the hash puzzles anymore so that makes things a bit simpler um also, I would like to add that with this uh, transaction pool um, um, separ uh, separation in, in Aragon, it's actually it um, th th this what, what Igor mentioned that uh, in Aragon uh, we try to separate uh, big components uh, um, and transaction pool is one such component, and with this uh, separation, it potentially allows us to protect. Uh, uh, our nodes nodes against malicious transactions. So, for instance, uh, somebody finds an uh, um, a weakness in uh, in uh, the gas schedule and uh, creates a transaction which is relatively cheap in gas terms, but is very very computationally expensive. And uh, if we separate our transaction pool, then it can filter out such um, uh, hazardous transactions. That is awesome. Um, just to follow up on that, 
I, I understand this uh, is currently not supporting and it started as a small team, but if we look into the current picture of uh, the demographic of client diversity here, Erigon actually stands on the second position. And after Open Ethereum, when it is like not supporting any further upgrade, do you think the version of Akula may be helpful to get more uh, users adding to the Erigon community? I think like it's a bit of a, I think the, the, the reason why at least we like as an old runner and uh, I used open Ethereum always was not because it's written in Rust, but because it has tracing APIs that are fast. Uh, and uh, that thing is more or less fully supported. I think it's fully supported in Aragon already and it will be supported of course in the, the forks. So it doesn't really matter which one will you run <clears throat> later on. If you really, really want a Rust client then probably yes, it's great to, to wait for a cooler. But if you want a uh, tracing uh, today, you can might as well just run Aragon and yeah, you ha you'll have the same open Ethereum tracing. We ended up even like having some, I remember we used to have some flags to even repeat some bugs from open Ethereum tracing. So they're like 100% compatible, even though it's maybe not totally correct traces. So it's plug and play uh, change. So yeah, it's a, one of the important features that's, uh, basically will carry the flag from open Ethereum, I think, for the like infrastructure players or like big DeFi apps or something like that. That is nice to know. Uh, um, and uh, I think that um, in both uh, Akula and Silkram are uh, interesting, very interesting pieces of technology in the long run because um, they uh, can be uh, they can achieve uh, ultimately better performance and uh, uh, they can either be used for um, uh, for people uh, uh, like maybe they, they might be used for, say for block builders where you want to like ultimate performance or potentially this is another long long term vision they potentially can be used on mobile because uh, Again, they, they will be uh, lighter on, on your battery compared to like garbage collector overhead. But right now, I would say both uh, Silkworm and Akula are for those users, for, for power users who want, who, who see them not as a finished product, but as pieces of great technology that they can tweak and maybe like go deep and yet tweak that technology to their needs yeah basically like i would say that's uh, already like running quite quite a few nodes uh, with even Aragon, it gets quite a bit of more like requests per second from a node on like typical east calls for any bigger DeFi application than other nodes that we can compare with and uh, i think with, with asset with silk rpc it's even faster than that of course, like for instance, I don't usually run it in production just because it's it's not yet time to, to probably run it fully in production. Uh, but uh, like we're really, really looking forward to also run it because then it's basically even basically it makes you even cheaper to run your like DeFi service or something on top of these nodes because you just need less of them with more throughput. Um, so and uh, I'd like to also to tell who are the our currently who are the users of Aragon and what its uh, uh, current strength uh, uh, well our strength number one is of course full archive nodes because um, the disk foot footprint is around two terabytes while if you want a full archive node with uh, uh, guess that's maybe 10, 10 terabytes so that's our strength number one uh, and uh, our weakness is that we only support uh, um, sync from genesis uh, so we execute all the transactions from genesis and it takes about uh, two three days it, it uh, gets your um, full archive node but uh, we want a faster sync uh, time for users who don't want a full, full archive node. And that's uh, part of our future releases. Uh, uh, we call them Aragon 2, but it will be not, not a single upgrade, up, up but a series of upgrades, including 
uh, fundamental database and data access uh, uh, re re re-architecture. Um, and we already started uh, moving in, in this Aragon to a series of upgrades. Uh, we uh, introdu uh, introduced uh, tor torrent uh, sync of uh, blocks of all Aragon blocks, and we want to utilize the torrent technology for our uh, sync uh, more because it's. Uh, the idea is that, uh, that, that with with uh, torrent you can um, it, it, it is again it's kind of this modularization of concerns and uh, if your sync time is low then with torrent you can uh, spawn uh, uh, a new seeder without maybe a need uh, of uh, of a, a full node right so you, you can it, it gives you another um, degree of freedom in terms of uh, balancing your performance. That's uh, th that's uh, with uh, different modularized components. You can uh, have uh, a number of uh, Dev P two P centuries that are solved by a single uh, what we call Aragon core. Um, th that that's the point uh, I wanted to make. Awesome. That's quite. Uh interesting introduction around the client and all the options those are available for users because this is much special so let's move towards uh, upgrade and merge related questions before we jump into merge i know gray glacier which is expected uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow in a, in a couple of days i wonder um how do you guys see different client releases uh, in between the March and other upcoming upgrades. Uh, to answer your questions about question about uh, releases, um, right now we have two flavors of Aragon releases. We have uh, all the uh, more stable Aragon beta releases that uh, were created uh, before the 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 the, the um, Aragon tool. Uh, uh, re-architecture work started. So th these are more stable and uh, uh, but the, the, the we, we they, are, they are not going to be to be merge compatible. So you can use them for uh, gray glacier. Um, and so for gray glacier you have two options. you can download you can use our very latest, Alpha release, which contains uh, the beginning of uh, Aragon two re refactorings, including uh, including torrent sync, or you can use uh, the beta release, which is called I think uh, uh, two two thousand. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check, but it, it contains the deprecated suffix in it. Uh, uh, but for for the merge, all the work has been done in our uh, development branch. Um, so both the the work on on uh, Aragon to um, architecture improvements and the merge happened in in that de development branch, which uh, is uh, the source of our alpha releases. Yeah, so basically <clears throat> the, the old beta, uh, the version is by the way, 2022-0405 deprecated. And it basically ends after the great glacier uh, is done. So when the merge happens, it won't be supported anymore. And the only version that uh, goes and supports the merge will be so-called Aragon 2, currently in the alpha channel. So yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what we run, for instance, on the, for the testnet validators already for the devnet or shadow forks and, and, and things like that. Taking a step back, uh, coming to the point that uh, Andrew shared uh, about the Erigon version 2.0, is it something that can be expected post March? Um, yes. Um, so, um... We have a blog, it's aragon.substack.com, um, and um, Alexei has written a, a, a number of posts there describing how Aragon 2 will be rolled out. So uh, there is his post from 
on, on the 12th of April, Aragon 2, 3, three upgrades. Um, so the, the first kind of Aragon 2.1 uh, will happen with the merge. It introduces uh, uh, the, the torrent infrastructure for downloading um, static files like uh, historic, uh, um, um, uh, historical um, Ethereum blocks. And then the second and third upgrade, they will happen after the merge. Yeah, so and basically so we already are in the process of like stabilizing the, the current version of like yeah 2.1 or 2.0 if you want uh, <clears throat> of the Aragon 2. So it will yeah will come with the merge like you can already test it. It's just yeah it's an it's an we I mean we are trying to be quite strict about labeling things. So we're labeling it alpha because we know that there are some known issues within it. So as soon as we fix these things that's going to also probably go to into the beta and then it's probably will be as stable as the previous beta and then and we we are planning to do this before the merge actually happens on mainnet so everybody who runs Aragon nodes will be will need to just upgrade the nodes and that's it basically so uh, i have a follow-up question here um we mentioned about uh, uh, stabilizing the current version of Aragon. Are there any specific instruction or specific uh, points to be noted by node operators uh, while they are upgrading uh, their nodes for a merge or even after merge someone wants to join? Are there any special instructions for them? Well, I mean, apart from that, because we, we did it like quite a bit. So now you have to run two nodes in parallel. So <laughs> that's what comes with it. And they need to share like an encryption key. Like, but that's that's true for any execution plus consensus layer client. Apart from that, like I didn't notice much difference between running the Aragon one node versus Aragon two node in the merge configuration that with a couple of caveats that's of course the Aragon two is a little bit less stable right now. Like there are a couple of things that needs to be fixed, uh, I think. And also that as soon as it switches to like the, the after post merge, it's it's a bit slower to sync than before that because we cannot, or well, right now, I don't think like it's, it's probably should be supported that the checkpoint sync, but right now it just syncs block by block. So it's a bit inefficient in terms of catching up with the network, but then you still get the same performance, same good performance on the, RPC side, at least I didn't notice any difference between the in the performance of RPCs of like old Oregon and new Oregon under load. So they both behave quite quite nicely. So yeah, it's it's not that much of a difference. One one thing that you need to note that between if you run the old Oregon, like the beta version and the currently deprecated version, the databases are not compatible. So you will need to resync the the nodes like but what i do like as a let's say a node operator i usually think one node do a snapshot of the drive and then just clone it <laughs> to make multiple nodes so it's usually not a problem and this thing is usually automated and anybody who runs like more than three to four nodes and if you just run three to four you can just resync them from scratch and with BitTorrent sync it also makes it a bit faster on the uh on the downloading data side and of course, it also prepares us as Aragon very good to the, I forgot what was the AP that we shouldn't, like the historical blocks will not be served over the zfp 2 p anymore. So we already have kind of a side channel to like serve them in off, off chain basically. So we should be pretty much very quickly compliant with that if it goes through. Um, and and uh, I'd like to add that uh, for, well, this sync speed, we definitely uh, want to uh, profile it and optimize it on on uh, in Aragon on our side. But I think uh, in general, the, the problem is uh, that um, on the CL side, unless you enable checkpoint sync, then uh, the consensus layer uh, will uh, feed the execution layer block by block and it will be slow for both Aragon, Geth, uh, Bezo, whatnot. So uh, I've been talking, I've been, uh, I've raised this uh, issue uh, at um, Oco Dev. 
Uh, and I think uh, for the main end, it makes perfect sense to enable checkpoint sync uh, on the CL side by default. Otherwise, without checkpoint sync, uh, it will be prohibitively slow. Oh, I almost forgot one more thing that you need to note. Actually, if you're a node operator and you're switching from the old Aragon, like pre merge and then the post merge, is that right now the, we used to run RPC daemon by default as an outside process. And right now it's also built in and enabled by default to simplify the setup because so you don't have to jiggle like more containers that you need or more processes that you need. That means that if you can just by default, you will have RPC daemon built in in Aragon, just like you have in Geth or other clients, but you can still run it separately, but just you need to make sure that there you need to disable the internal one, otherwise they will conflict on ports. <laughs> so that's uh, a small thing. That's good uh, to know. I mean, that's a good piece of advice for node operators to maybe take care of. And I remember the conversation of checkpoint sync uh, initiated by Mikhail. Let's see what's the decision there. If it is enabled by default, then I hope it will be useful for more of the EL clients. Yeah, like we are, again, as a node operator, if we need to scale the right now for ops and for instance, we want to scale more nodes, we definitely do checkpoint sync to our own neighbor nodes because otherwise it takes not forever to sync even on the reps it's like relatively slow and if we want like very quickly to get like from five nodes to let's say 20 <laughs> like without checkpoint sync is going to be quite uh, sluggish talking about node operators um, uh, i may be missing something here but help me understand who are the main target users here? Like what kind of people should be running Aragon node? I understand it is not supporting proof of work, but it will be as good as any other client of execution layer post merge. But so far, what was the main uh, user base for Aragon? Well, I can answer some of this. <laughs> like anybody who runs quite a lot of nodes gets economies of scale better, especially when execution is close. That could be your typical infrastructure providers, like I don't Fura or like Alchemy or whoever. Uh, also bigger DeFi players, if you've taken like about exchanges and whatnot. So they do a tons of requests, like tons, like thousands and thousands of requests per second to nodes. And the, the reason that's with Aragon, they might have to do to have like four times or three times less nodes to, to achieve the same performance. Everybody who runs on scale, it's also, uh, I've noticed that from my experience that it's much easier <clears throat> or much safer to scale Aragon to some extent because of the, we, we have like an ACID database means that it has transactions. So it's, unless we have bugs in the Aragon code, it cannot be left in the inconsistent state. And that means if you stop the node to make a snapshot to like create more nodes, like if, if, if you do, I, I do it with some, especially on some other blockchains, like Ethereum is fine, but like on some other blockchains, you need to like stop the node, wait like a minute to make sure that everything is written to disk for sure. And only then clone the drive because otherwise you will end up, the nodes will not start because it was not completely written in consistent state. With Aragon, we can just kill the node, <laughs> snapshot it, like, and just run it. Uh, so it's it's what may, way more, and also if somebody needs the again, it's more for the DeFi players. Sometimes they do you know analytics on the chain, and they need tracing of the historical data. And I think Aragon with serving archival data is so far the, the best with both like small data, smaller data snapshot, basically the footprint, sorry, like basically under two terabyte for the full uh, archival data with tracing on. So that's also is. Uh, Interesting. So that's for the bigger player for the home enthusiasts. I think that's going to be interesting when the BitTorrent sync will become the, the bigger one because right now it still needs to re execute all the transactions. But I mean, it's still cool that I have a laptop here that I'm speaking to you from, right? And I have a full archival Ethereum nodes on this laptop, like uh, as a basically a individual. Of course, yeah takes a lot of space <laughs> like and it's not a cheap laptop configuration but still it's a laptop it's not something you need to buy in in the server rack or something like this for the full archival thing so those are the things that come to mind oh yeah one more thing that's very important you shouldn't underestimate the pruning that we have because our pruning is uh, how to say it is deterministic so you know how many blocks of history you keep behind and it's super important let's say <laughs> Again, there's a little trick. 
Like if you want to provide an archival node, uh, but not everybody is using archival node. It's very expensive to run archival node. What you do is you route request that a non-archival, even if you think that your node is archival, as a, like a, as an infrastructure provider, you route a non-archival request to non-archival nodes and an archival request to the archival nodes. But how do you know which ones are archival or not? By the block number. And knowing to which block our archival nodes are pruned is makes it logic very simple. So I know that, okay, I, we keep last 6,000 blocks or something like this in, in, in the chain, 6,000 history items. So if we have an RPC call that requests more than that, it goes to archival and like 99.9 .9 requests never ask anything <laughs> more than that. And they go to non-archival node. And that way we can keep like, let's say 20 non-archival nodes and only one archival and still have the clients happy who want archival access because they usually want it rarely. So that's also one of the interesting things. With some other clients, when it's non-deterministic, it's very hard to figure out, like, but it's dependent on memory or something. Like it's very hard to figure out when to route those requests. It's just like my, <laughs> a little bit node operator inside baseball, if you want. <laughs> yeah. I know generally speaking, it is recommended, like uh, if someone is running a validator node, then they should have multiple uh, nodes running just to have in, in case of emergency, they can switch to another client. Uh, so for that, uh, Aragon is always there, but I was just curious. Well, moving on to uh, test nets and uh, shadow forks that are happening uh, with respect to the merge upgrade. My understanding is uh, ignoring a few bugs and issues which may occur with any other client. Erigon has been one of those clients those participated in almost uh, every test net. Would you maybe like to talk about the performance of Erigon in the March test net so far and uh, how generally speaking it is interacting with the, the interrupt session with the consensus layer clients? Um. Well, I think uh, for uh, for the recent uh, in the recent test nets, Aragon has been doing more or less uh, fine. Uh, we had uh, a, an issue where we created um, as a validator, we created uh, blocks with no transactions. Uh, that that has been fixed, and we are monitoring um uh, whether it occurs in, or, or not but uh, so we are, we are keeping close eye on that uh there was an issue in shadow forks not in test nets like like kiln or, or obstant but in shadow uh, forks because shadow forks are different uh, um in um when the merge happens on main on the main net um, there will be at some point, probably after the merge, uh, there will be a, a so-called merge net split block, and um, it'll uh, fork uh, the nodes that uh, haven't uh, enabled uh, the the transition from the rest of, of, of from from like the, the, the main net. Uh, but on on shadow fork, the idea is that you do not do that. So you have a lot of peers from from the mainnet, and <laughs> you have weird issues because you don't have actually peers from your shadow fork, right? Uh, and that's why uh, you you have some some kind of weird failures, but they are not indicative of uh, any uh, any real uh, uh, test net or like uh, any uh, or other main net uh, the, the one workaround for Aragon is to actually uh, to specify a static peers that from the the correct shadow fork so that you at least you have some peers otherwise i mean the idea the idea for shadow forks is also you don't want to filter out peers because you want to uh, receive transactions from the mainnet, but on the other hand, all your uh, all, the, all those peers they have a totally different worldview. They, they see totally different blocks, and it's a bit schizophrenic. Right? <laughs> so this shadow fox issues, <laughs> uh, yeah, they are they are a bit niche. Yeah, and and speaking of like running the the testnet specifically. 
I've been running kiln validators. I've been running quite a bit of uh, Robston validators. And so far it's been like fine. Again, there are some bugs that are specific to Aragon that are not specific to merge. That sometimes requires to like restart the Aragon, but that has nothing to do if you run it with non-merge configuration on the main net, it has the same bug. So it's not non-merge specific. But other than that, again, we're monitoring right now the blocks that are like provided by those uh, validators. So they have uh, transactions inside. So not only the blocks are correct, not only the attestations are correct, but also they have transactions inside. And we run some kind of a, well, currently I run, I think to uh, post merge uh, consensus layer clients, uh, namely Tseco and uh, Nimbus, just because again, Prism is already big. <laughs> Like, so we are trying to do a little bit more like niche uh, consensus layer clients at this time, trying to, to run them. And I just like, I disclaimer, I used to work at status at some point in time. So I still have some warm feeling towards the team and, <laughs> and whatnot. So <laughs> that's why Nimbus <clears throat> uh, in particular. And so far I had pretty good experience uh, with them. They just basically, you specify the execution engine and point you specify the, the token. And then you open the ports and they work most of the time. So, but yeah, of course, the important part is to figure out the edge cases as well. That's why, like, things like shadow forks are super important. Absolutely. That's the whole purpose of having all these tests. And shadow forking has been a boon. Like, we can do it multiple times with the same configuration, just changing it like every time dealing with the issues that happened in the last time. So uh, if I understand correctly, the issue that Andrew was explaining uh, just now is that the peering issue you mentioned. And if so, did that happen for Shadow Fork 7 or had it happened earlier as well? Uh, I think it uh, probably, um, it probably had happened uh, earlier as well. Um, but uh, hopefully with uh, the addition of static peers, it should be less of an issue. I understand. And the resolution is also quite handy at static nodes. It's helping in testing. That's useful. And talking about the status and numbers, um, I can understand your interest. Uh, we had a chat with a team of status and they are also like uh, storage efficient. Um, client, so I can understand the relation between Aragon and Nimbus over there. Yeah, <clears throat> I noticed, for instance, that the CPU wise and uh, Nimbus really has uh, once less resources than, especially cycle. I'm, I'm not just, but just is just if you even compare it like Lighthouse, that is Rust, it's a very efficient language. Nimbus is Nimbus, very efficient language. Uh, Prism is Go, which is efficient but still have garbage collections, so you take it to the a little bit of star in Java or like, what's it, is it written in uh, Kotlin or whatever, but GVM basically has even slower garbage collection. So if you see the, like how the CPU works, okay, it's like works for well, then the garbage collection goes, then goes works for works. So, so we specifically play with Teco and Nimbus as kind of opposite <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> if you want uh, of uh, like CPU usage. But Teco on the other hand, it's like, you see the, they're very targeting the enterprise users with all these fancy health checks that they have, like uh, nice summaries in the log. So they're very, very easy to plug and play into if you want a Kubernetes cluster or like in, into like uh, Nomad clusters or something like this. So it's also interesting. So it is good to know like uh, take one numbers are the two common uh, CL uh, that is being used uh, in combination with the Aragon. So this can be a favorite of yours. I'm just curious to understand like uh, with other client combination, the other CL client combination, the performance of Aragon is generally the same or uh, are there any advantages of using take and Nimbus? Well, I also tried Prism. Uh, it worked well. It just, I thought that it's okay. It's a, still a majority client, so I never bothered to scale it. So we have probably one prism to maybe 10 or more uh, tech or Nimbus instances. Didn't notice <coughs> much specific differences, but I didn't like, 
we also run Prism on the pre-merge, like a big chain mainnet validators uh, with Aragon as a just is one endpoint, not the execution layer, but just providing logs for who is the active validator basically or not. And with this, it was like rock solid uh, as well. So I one thing that I probably need to, to look at, I didn't ever run Lodestar like as a, as a consensus layer, like uh, probably, yeah, I'll need to check this configuration as well on one of the test nets to see how it behaves. But again, Lighthouse was also quite quite okay, but just <clears throat> you have that much things and just that much time. So it's like kind of we're trying to <laughs> manage this uh, a little bit in a, in a way that's still very useful, but uh, yeah, it's not that easy to cover everything. <laughs> Interesting. So the merge test net, uh, it started about a year ago with Rayonism, right? I wonder, are there any uh, specific incidents or stories or maybe any learning experience uh, during this entire testing period uh, till date that you would like to share with our viewers? Um, yes, uh, I can talk a little bit about uh, our journey to the merge. Uh, we, um, kind of um, we didn't join uh, rayonism and uh, kintsugi so we were a bit late we joined uh, kiln though and um, there was a couple of reasons uh, one reason is that in aragon before the merge uh, how we used to operate internally is that we have a, a single state, so a, a state corresponding to a certain block. And um, we, uh, so we didn't have uh, easy, quick access to multiple states corresponding to multiple blocks. Uh, but the engine and in the proof of work world, it, um, worked fine because you you occasionally can do a reorg uh, but um, you kind of um, um, to, to do that you the re reorgs don't, don't happen often and uh, you don't flip flop typically between different side, side chains so you can uh, so we, you can still operate fine with the single state, you, which you occasionally uh, unwind to your uh, fork point and then apply changes, uh, new blocks on, on your new side chain. And how the engine API was designed originally before Kiln is uh, that it didn't have this the same assumptions as the proof of road um, uh, proof of work world, and uh, it could uh, send more requests. It, it, it assumed that you you can you can have access to pretty much a lot of states uh, corresponding to multiple blocks simultaneously, um, which wasn't the case in Aragon and still isn't. Um, that that. Uh, that meant that we were not able to implement uh, the API easily, but uh, Mikhail uh, uh, Kalinin, among others, uh, uh, have redes redesigned the engine API, make it uh, correspond better to how all clients operated in the proof of work world, and, and specifically to make it uh, suitable for Aragon. So with that redesign of the engine API, we uh, we implemented it and joined um, joined Kiln and and later testnets. Um, it's still it, it's still uh, not fully done yet, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been uh, with with my colleagues. I've been looking at um, uh, the tests in Hive. So you might have heard uh, there is this website hivetest2.ethdevops.io, which runs uh, a lot of tests. And right now, Aragon is failing like 48 out of 114 engine API tests. So we are working on 
bringing that number down. But a couple of weeks ago, it was like we were, we were failing 80, right? So there is some progress. It's, it still takes time. Um, and um, in, in general, more testing. So we, we yeah, we, we've been paying more attention to Hive tests now. And uh, that, that's very helpful that um, um, Ethereum Foundation uh, have invested into, into this. Uh, it's kind of, it's still not, for me as, as, as a developer, it's not as convenient because they operate via Docker and uh, there is this level of indirection. So it's not like unit tests that we run as part of our continuous integration, it's an, an external process. But on the, other, on the other hand, I'm very grateful to, to the people who invested time and effort into writing those tests, they're, they're, they're super useful. Uh, and uh, also the risk of tosis and there are other tests. Uh, so I would say now with the merge, we are in entering this, uh, like the, the basic blocks, um, the, the fundamental blocks are more or less in place. We might still do some architectural improvements uh, maybe after the merge, but right now we are focusing more on testing and uh, fixing all corner cases and, things, and uh, improving the stability. And we also want to promote at some point our alpha to, to beta. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's such things they they take time and it's it's like as a developer I, you know you the, the last like you you get you implement ninety percent but the, then the last ten percent take another ninety percent time wise. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the last bits uh, they take time. Uh one more story from from me, for instance, is that uh, initially when I was preparing to just in general support the merge, like the first validators and whatnot, uh, I was thinking to of running basically both processes of like consensus layer and execution layer on a single machine somewhere in like a data center or a cloud. Uh, but it turns out that uh, like I we actually started running it and we see like okay it works it works it works and then it starts failing at the stations and whatnot then. You restart and it works, it works, it works, it starts failing the station. And it turns out that, uh, like, if you don't have physically two different disks, at least disks for both consensus execution layer, both like with everyone and maybe with other uh, as well, but then uh, those nodes are still so intensive on like disk IO. So even fast, like NVMe drives are not fast enough. So the nodes are slowly getting out of sync. Like, so they're not fast enough. So you notice them. So some attestations are fine and some come coming late. And there's like, pfft, at some point it just blows up completely. So that was a bit of a story that we actually either needed servers with two separate NVMe disks, completely separate so they can saturate both. Or as we did, we just split them into two different machines with uh, even slower, just normal SSDs. And it was fast enough to, to work then. The only problem was to share the, the token, the encryption token, but we kind of got around it by generating it outside of any nodes and just feeding it to both of the nodes. And then, so that's worked quite okay. So, so for especially, I think this might be important for those who stay at home since they will need to run both nodes. Uh, so if you right now have your validator on your Intel MOOC or whatever, uh, it's better to install a separate second SSD for the execution layer uh, client uh, to make sure that everything is as stable as possible. That is highly recommended. So listener, if you are a staker or if you plan to become an uh, Ethereum staker, please make sure that you are having both nodes running in parallel and of course, multiple clients. So far, it's uh, all about what client team have been providing to users. Now I have a question for you. Uh, what are the expectation of uh, devs in terms of support that they can expect from community or from the foundation? Uh, recently, uh, we heard about the EX client incentive program. Do you think uh, those were helpful uh, in working for the emerge? 
Well, I, I can talk about this one a little bit. I think that's it, it's basically finally that we just finished, uh, like we, we just entered the participation fully today, basically. So today all the validators went online for the Aragon. <laughs> Uh, literally quite today so it's uh it's interesting i think it's a it's, it's a good program in terms of yeah because when you run your own nodes you kind of don't want to lose this stick <laughs> so you kind of need to support this uh but uh, i think it's just uh, it, you know it's a good incentivization to just fix your node and make sure that it's stable long run because i think that was a little bit of a disconnect that i noticed as because i'm one of the people who both run nodes as kind of professionally and also develop nodes. So there was a little bit of a disconnect between people who build nodes and who run nodes. Again, it's, it's getting better and better with Ethereum, but I see, for instance, other blockchains, they are really struggling that people just build the node and it works for, I know, three hours on their computer and it's fine, but then you try to run it for like a month and then it blows up by itself, <laughs> something like this. So yeah, right now it's, uh, I think when, the client teams have to run the nodes 24 seven for the long time. And that's the only good thing for, and it makes it easier for the, for the operators. One thing that I could ask the community, it's just a general, probably it's a general pain of like, <laughs> of the open source developer. Like if you want some feature or if you want some feature changed, like an Aragon, we had this with health checks. Like I had a pet peeve of mine. Like I developed a health check for Aragon that was good for me and for, for how I run nodes. And then I get a lot of complaints that it doesn't support Kubernetes way. And I don't use Kubernetes myself, but like we are open source. We are very open to like pull requests and changes as long as they're, they're reasonable. So if you dislike something or if you think something needs to be added, like some parameter changed, or something like this it is of course first step is good if you report it in the github but then if you are able to like to contribute back to the thing because we are not selling everyone to anybody right so it's like you can take the source code and modify it and run it and actually earn money doing doing that so i think like if you're making sure that okay your pet peeve bug is like fixed by either hiring or getting some engineer who fixes it or like fixing like contributing back that would be like amazing that's probably the best thing we can <laughs> just dream of so but of course like even since different people run it to different configurations just decent bug requests uh, bu bug reports like okay i run this version on this hardware i did that and that that's what happened would be also very very important so because we we're trying our best like we're doing a lot of things we're doing a lot of testing here and there in different configurations but still you might have some esoteric bug that we will never be able to even know about because we never run it on a certain like hardware with a certain limitations and whatnot. so that would be like a bit of a message for me <laughs> i don't know andrew what about you um i i totally agree with your points uh, and uh, um i'm very grateful to the ethereum foundation who's been supporting aragon uh, uh, financially and uh, but uh, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, we that developers don't come free. So we 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 spend a lot of uh, money on paying our team members, and uh, uh, yeah. So it's not it's uh, all the, the the financial support from the EF, uh, including the client in, in incentive program, is is highly appreciated. Absolutely, I agree to both points. Like because this is open source, we should encourage more contributors to come forward and share their thoughts, share their feedbacks, and probably that would be added here. Yeah, we're trying to be really, really supportive, like of especially the new people who contribute to, to Aragon, trying to be open and reasonable with code reviews and whatnot. So don't be scared as as well, like or intimidated by. Of course, a complex code base, yada, 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 but like we are all people and we're all just just normal people like working at Aragon, so we are very open to like uh, suggestions and, and uh, pull requests. And I'd like to add that uh, people who maybe who are interested in uh, learning um, more um, about uh, the execution layer specifically uh, and the theorem in general uh, and who are C++ or us developers, they might be interested in 
uh, Silkworm or Akula because their code bases are smaller compared to Aragon's and uh, some th things uh, might be cleaner uh, and uh, it might be a good learning experience in terms of you like you want like specifically to understand i don't know how precompiles work or like how some some intricacies of uh, of execution i think you 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 might find cleaner code there but yeah all all help is uh, in, in in terms of uh, nice uh, bug reports uh, pull requests is is uh, appreciated Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, these are all useful information for new developers as well as people who are experienced and they are looking forward to maybe experiment with different clients. Option, those are available. Uh, well, it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much, Andrew and Igor. We appreciate your sharing insight of uh, the client development and merge preparation. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Aragon has the second largest share of Ethereum's client distribution, which is over 8% as per Ethernodes. Yet it is far away from a decent looking percentage share of a decentralized network. My hope with the release of this episode is that it encourages new users willing to join Ethereum node running, may consider Aragon for execution client and help improve the stats of Ethereum's client diversity. And on this note, thanks to everyone watching or listening to this episode. Should you have any question, leave a comment, reach us at eCathodist Discord. Check out descriptions for link to useful resources and guest Twitter to follow. Keep sharing your love with Ethereum cat headers. Stay tuned for more on Know Your Client series. Cheers.